Okay, John's Gospel, chapter 6, and we're going to read from verse 15 uh, down to verse 21. John 6, 15 down to verse 21. It says, when Jesus therefore perceived that they would come and take him by force to make him a king, he departed again into a mountain himself alone. And when even was now come, his disciples went down onto the sea and entered into a ship and went over the sea toward Capernaum. And it was now dark and Jesus was not come to them. And the sea arose by reason of a great wind that blew. So when they had rowed about five and twenty or thirty furlongs, they see Jesus walking on the sea and drawing near, nigh unto the ship, and they were afraid. But he saith unto them, It is I, be not afraid. Then they willingly received him into the ship, and immediately the ship was at the land whither they went. And again, God will bless that reading uh, of his word to us this evening. I want to title this section, The Authority of the Lord Jesus Over Nature. The Authority of the Lord Jesus Over Nature. And we're going to see, I think, that it's a very fitting section to read uh, and to consider together uh, in the light of the year that we've just had. I think many of us would say that 2020 has certainly been a stormy year for many of us. <laughs> uh, it's not been the year we anticipated. Uh, we've had uh, COVID problems uh, here south of the border. We've had political instability that's still going on and uh, economic uh, issues as well as a result of COVID. So it's been a very stormy time. And as we go into 2021, uh, the, the forecast is more storms ahead. <laughs> so uh, I think this is a very fitting portion of scripture to consider. In the previous section, we, we saw the feeding of the 5,000, and we tied it in with uh, Psalm 78. And the question in Psalm 78 and verse 19, I'll just read it again, just to, uh, it was the feeding of the 5,000, but it was uh, kind of framed on this question. Uh, yea, they spake against God. They said, can God furnish a table in the wilderness? And we saw how the Lord Jesus wonderfully uh, provided uh, for 5,000 men plus women and children uh, in a, uh, a deserted place uh, where there was no available food, no funds to buy the food, and yet he provided miraculously. And we want to uh, tie our section today in with another psalm, Psalm 107. I'd like you to turn there, please, to Psalm 107, and I'm going to read from verse 23, kind of a little bit lengthier than the previous one, uh, from verse 23 down to verse 32, but I think when we read it, you'll see the pertinence of it in connection with our study that we'll be doing this evening. It says in verse 23, they that go down to the sea in ships that do business in great waters, these see the works of the Lord and his wonders in the deep. For he commandeth and raiseth the stormy wind, which lifteth up the waves thereof. They mount up to the heaven, they go down again to the depths, their soul is melted because of trouble. They reel to and fro and stagger like a drunken man and are at their wit's end. And then they cry unto the Lord in their trouble, and he bringeth them out of their distresses. He maketh the storm a calm, so that the waves thereof are still. Then are they glad, because they be quiet. So he bringeth them unto their desired haven. Oh, that men would praise the Lord for his goodness, for his wonderful works to the children of men. Let them exalt him also in the congregation of the people and praise him in the assembly of the elders. And so we really, the, the beautiful words of that psalm are what we're going to witness in this section. We're going to actually witness the Lord Jesus do exactly the same thing, to, to calm the raging storm and to bring uh, his people, his disciples, back to their desired haven. And uh, glory to his name for what he's about to do in this section. And so just a few preliminary remarks 
uh, about this sign. Uh, this sign, unlike the previous one, which was witnessed by multitudes, okay, so there were 5,000 people there that actually uh, enjoyed the blessing of the, of the, the sign, uh, and plus women and children. So it was a very public event. Whereas this incident is very private. In fact, uh, it's, a, it's the disciples are the only ones that actually witness this event. And so it clearly has lessons for disciples. It's, it has significance for disciples, for the, the disciples at that time, but also I believe there's significance for those of us today that would consider the, ourselves to be his disciples or his followers. There's an important message in it for us. Now, if you remember last time, we, we looked at the feeding of the 5,000, but we also, we kind of paralleled the account in Mark's gospel chapter six with the account in John chapter six. And we, we're going to do the same thing. It's not in all four Gospels. We're going to find this in Matthew 14, verse 22 through 33. And then again, we're going to find it in Mark 6, 45 and 50, uh, through 52. So what I want us to do, we're going to concentrate on the Matthew account as well as uh, this in John. So I'd like you to turn in your Bibles to Matthew 14. And if you've got a ribbon or some kind of marker, stick it in there, please, uh, from verse 22 onwards. And we're going to be flipping back and forth a little bit to, to uh, see uh, just the different information that the dis different gospel writers give us. John's account is by far the briefest. And the implication is that in, in contracting it down much smaller than Matthew's or Mark's account, is that uh, he, because he's writing after Matthew and Mark, he, he's presuming that his readers already have had access to Matthew's account, Mark's account, have, have read them and are familiar with them. And so he doesn't have to give all the same information. John includes it as one of his seven signs, uh, again, with, with that goal in view that we uh, we keep reminding ourselves of. It's, it's important that we don't lose the big picture of the gospel as we look at individual portions. And that is John 20, verse 30 and 31. Um, and many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life through his name. And so, he, John, as he selects these signs, this is one he chooses to include. Again, because it's so evident that Jesus is the eternal son of God because of his authority, his power over nature. And so that's why he chooses to add this one uh, to his already wonderful uh, selection of signs. So far, we've, we've observed the Lord Jesus turning water into wine. We've observed the sick being healed on more than one occasion. We've seen the hungry multitudes who have been fed. And now we're going to see that he has power over the natural laws of the universe. So let's dive in verse 15 of chapter 6 of John. It says, when Jesus therefore perceived that they would come and take him by force to make him a king, he departed again into a mountain himself alone. And so <clears throat> the crowd were evidently greatly impressed by the miracle that we had witnessed, the feeding of the 5,000, yeah, so much so that they uh, proclaimed him uh, in verse 14 to be that prophet that should come into the world that Moses had mentioned in Deuteronomy 18. And they also were convinced that he was a king. And they wanted him to be their king. And I want to suggest to you what they wanted was uh, him just as Moses. Remember, we said that it, this, is, this event occurs close to Passover. And they'd be thinking about Moses. And they would be thinking about uh, the fact that he delivered them from Egyptian bondage. And I believe that at the back of their minds is, uh, if this man can do this to us in the wilderness, feed us miraculously, Surely he's the man 
to overflow, overthrow Roman bondage and set us free. And so they seek to take him by force and make him king. It's interesting that they mention prophet and they mention king. But remember, the Lord Jesus has three significant offices in the scriptures. He's prophet, priest, and king. And what these people really needed was a priest who could bring them to God. That's what they really needed, because the priestly system, as we're going to see throughout the Gospel of John, has become so corrupted and wicked anyway, they need a priest. And they need somebody who can bring them to God and deliver them from the greater bondage than that of Rome, and that being the bondage of sin. But they did not see that at this time. They want deliverance from Rome. And it's interesting, it says uh, that they uh, tried to come and take him by force to make him a king. And it's just an important thing to recognize that no man will make him king. Scripture says that God will make him king. The Father will make him king. We, I think, referred to this last time, but it's worthy of our contemplation again in Psalm 2 and verse 6. It will not be uh, some mass political movement that will cause him to be king, but God himself will do this. He says in Psalm 2 verse 6, Yet have I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion, he will put him there. He will set him there. And despite what men will do, they will not be able to overthrow him as king of all the earth in a coming day. And so the crowd uh, try to, uh, as it were, take him. And uh, I guess in their mind is we've got, we've got an army of 5,000 men, uh, you know, kind of plus women and children. Uh, we've got momentum here. We've got a miracle working Messiah. Uh, we'll take him and, and we'll go to Jerusalem and we'll sweep the Romans away and we'll get our <clears throat> nation back again. And that was uh, their thinking. That's in their minds. And so as a result of that, we read that the Lord Jesus uh, would have none of this. It says he departed uh, again uh, into a mountain himself. And I want us to, again, turn back to Matthew now, please. And we want to look at Matthew's account just to see more details on exactly how this happened. It says in verse 22 of Matthew 14, and, and straight away, Jesus constrained his disciples to get into a ship and go before him onto the other side, while he sent the multitudes away. And when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up into a mountain apart to pray. And when the evening was come, he was there alone. So several things that I want us to consider as we think uh, about Matthew's account here. Uh, first of all, again, I want to emphasize the great authority of the, the Lord Jesus. Uh, this crowd want to take him and make him king. And yet he sends them away, which tells us that there, again, must have been incredible authority in his voice to dismiss um, uh, 5,000 uh, 5, men, 7,500 at least people, uh, women and children, and to just dismiss them and send them away would tell you something. We've already been reminded of it in chapter 5. Uh, his voice has such authority that one day all that are in the graves will hear his voice and they'll come forth and live. And so we, we recognize the great power in the voice of the Lord Jesus because, because who he is, he's the word. And there's power in the one who is uh, the, the word uh, manifest in flesh. And so they respond, uh, the crowd dissipates uh, from the Lord Jesus as he sends them away. And he's also sent his disciples to get in the boat and cross the lake. And the reason is he wants to get alone and spend time in communion with his father. It says he went up into a mountain apart to pray. And when the evening was come, he was there alone. And again, just as we enter into this new year, I think it's very important that all of us learn the value of time spent alone in communion 
with God. If the Lord Jesus, as the perfect man, lived this life in such dependence uh, on the Father like this, uh, spending time in communion with him, spending time in his presence in prayer. Who do we think we are to think we could ever be effective in any way in our service for the Lord if we do not spend that time in communion with him? And so he went up to a mountain to pray, and when the evening was come, he was there alone. Can I make some suggestions to you about what could have been on the heart and mind of the Lord Jesus at this time? I want to suggest to you that one of the things that's on his mind is the disciples themselves. Even though he's up on the mountain and they're on the water, he still sees them because remember, he is the God of omniscience and uh, <clears throat> he, sees, he sees everything, he knows everything. And so he sees them. Uh, he is in control of the storm on the lake. Uh, and so he's very aware of their circumstances. But I think. There's a, there's a big issue going on here. I want to suggest to you what it might be. You see, the disciples, when they followed the Lord Jesus, I know at least one of them, but maybe more of them, had hopes that the Lord Jesus would indeed take uh, Jerusalem back from the Romans, would, would de defeat the enemies, uh, and, and would, uh, would basically conquer all those enemies and set up the kingdom. I think they believed that. They believed that earnestly, uh, that, that he would do that. And now he, he'd been faced with this opportunity, 5,000 men wanting to make him king, and he sends them away and sends the disciples away. And I think some of them are thinking, Lord, why did you miss this opportunity? What were you thinking? This is our moment. We should have seized this. This was our time. We had momentum with us. We should have gone to, to, to Jerusalem and vanquished the Romans. You say, where are you getting all that from, Mike? You're making this all up. Uh, well, I don't think so. Look at Luke's Gospel, chapter 24, for a moment. Luke 24, that Emmaus Road experience. Keep your finger in Matthew. We're going to come back there. Luke uh, 24, and notice verses 20 and 21. Uh, when the Lord Jesus is on the road to Emmaus uh, and <clears throat> the disciples that are there uh, are speaking to him, uh, this, is, this is what they say. Verse 19, he said to them, what things? And they said to him, concerning Jesus of Nazareth, which was a prophet mighty indeed and word before God and all the people, and how the chief priests and our rulers delivered him to be condemned to death and have crucified him. But we trusted that it had been he which should have redeemed Israel. And beside all this, today is the third day since these things were done. See, he, we thought he was going to redeem Israel. And he's not thinking of redeeming from sin. He's th they're thinking of redeeming them, uh, delivering them, if you like, from Roman bondage. We, we thought he was the one who was going to do it. And I'll guarantee one of them for sure was disappointed. Look at Acts 1, where the disciples are named, Acts chapter 1 and verse 13. And we'll mention one of them particularly. It says, when they were come in, they went up into an upper room, where abode both Peter and James and John and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James, the son of Alphaeus, and Simon Zelotes and Judas, the brother of James. I want to focus our attention on that individual, Simon Zelotes. You know what that means? Simon the Zealot, right? In other words, uh, and again, it must have been kind of interesting, the dynamics of the 12. Because on the one hand, you've got Matthew, who was a tax collector, collaborating with the oppressor, right? He's working for the Romans. <laughs> On the other hand, you've got Simon the Zealot, who's a revolutionary who wants to overthrow the Romans, right? He's, he's zealous uh, for his nation, for the national cause. And so I think the likes of Simon, when he saw this, this lost opportunity, was very heavy hearted as he was rowing that boat across the lake thinking, Lord, why? Why did you not take this opportunity? They wanted you 
to be king. Uh, they were willing to take you and make you king. You clearly have power. We saw that. We saw it demonstrated. Why didn't you do this? And so I believe that as they were rowing across the lake, their hearts were really heavy. And the Lord Jesus up on the mountain is there praying for them in their distress, in their hearts. <clears throat> now, although this is a real historical event, I want to, to do two illustrative pictures from this passage by way of application. It's something that I want to draw our attention to, two pictures. The first picture I want to suggest to you is this, that this is a lovely picture of Christ and the church now. Christ right now is in heaven at the Father's right hand. What is he doing there? Well, one thing we know he's doing, just like he was doing on the mountain, he was praying for his disciples. What is the Lord Jesus doing now? He ever lives, it says, Hebrews 7, verse 25, to make intercession for us. Isn't that wonderful? So, so whatever we're going through down here, isn't it nice, isn't it comfortable to know that he is now in an elevated place, not on the Golden Heights where he was here in this event, but he's actually in heaven itself, seated on the Father's throne, but he's there as our high priest and intercessor. And often his people find themselves in the storms of life down here. And in the storms of life, and maybe fearful, and he is praying for us. And one day, just as he comes to the disciples, as we're going to see, and he's going to come and take them safely to the shore. One day soon, our beloved Lord Jesus is going to come down to us. We're going to be caught up to meet him in the air, and he's going to take us to shore heaven and deliver us safely there. But while we're in the storm right now, he's at the right hand and of the Father, and he is praying for us. Well, it's going to be a lovely day when all the storms are past and we're, we're on shore heaven. But we can be assured that whatever 2021 brings before you, if nobody else prays for you, I know somebody who is committed to praying for you and will faithfully bring you before the Father on a regular basis because he ever lives with that purpose in view. And so what an encouraging picture that gives us. But now I want to give you a different picture, picture number two, and I want to see it as a picture of the unsaved. <clears throat> the disciples are now in the boat and it's dark, and the Lord Jesus has not come to them. They're all alone. You know, the unsaved world today is just like that. They're alone in the darkness without the Lord Jesus. What a terrible place to be in. But not just that. They've been launched upon the seas of time, cast upon their own resources, and the darkness overtakes them. And you've heard the phrase, I'm just paddling my own canoe, which is, sounds great, right? You know, it's kind of this, you know, I, I can do this thing. That's the way men think. But notice uh, in <clears throat> verse uh, John 6, 18, uh, it, it tells us this. It says, and the sea arose by reason of a great wind that blew. And so here are these unsaved people. They're paddling their own canoe, so to speak. They're, they think everything's going fine. And then the winds of adversities begin to blow. What an awful place to be in. Uh, again, we think of the, the storms of 2020. It's been hard for people. Some facing death of loved ones because of this, this pandemic. Uh, others uh, losing their jobs. Maybe some about to lose their homes because they can't pay their mortgages. Just a stormy time. Uh, the lockdowns caused all kinds of uh, abuse. Uh, just terrible things that people are going through. And imagine going through all of that on your own 
without anybody there to help you. And so this is the plight of the unsaved. Now we're going to pick that analogy up a little bit later, but I want you just at least get it in your mind and just recognize how much people need the Lord. I don't know that I would have wanted to have gone through this last year without the Lord. I, I can't imagine it. Uh, and yet there are multitudes. They do not have the Lord to lean on. They do not have him as their support. Uh, they do not have the encouragement that the Lord brings. So we'll think about that analogy, but I want you to at least see the picture. So look uh, back now, please, at our passage in John 6, and we're going to look at verse 19. We're going to be coming back to Matthew, so don't take your ribbon out. <clears throat> Chapter 6 and verse 19, it says, So when they had rowed about five and twenty or thirty furlongs, they see Jesus walking on the sea and drawing nigh unto the ship, and they were afraid. So <clears throat> th these experienced fishermen, remember these, uh, at least some of them, uh, this is where they made their bread and butter. This is, this is where they spent a lot of time. So they're experienced fishermen. They're rowing on the boat and they're making some progress. Uh, this uh, 30, 20 or 30 furlongs, it's somewhere between three to four miles or in Canadian, five to six kilometers. And so they're approximately halfway across the lake. In fact, uh, Mark's account and Matthew's account would tell us that they're about halfway across. And, and yet uh, something happens now which leaves them afraid, more afraid than the natural phenomena of the storm itself on the lake, which they would have experienced before. Remember, they're experienced fishermen. They know the lake. But they're seeing something that really causes fear to grip them. See, as they look out in the, in the darkness, they see this figure coming towards them. Now, they don't always see him because if you can imagine the, 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 the waves going up and down, sometimes uh, if he's walking on the water, he's on the top of the crest of the wave. And sometimes when he's down in the bottom, they don't see him. And then he's on the crest again. But they keep seeing sporadically the, this, this figure coming towards them. And they're scared, but they're, they clearly imagine there's something supernatural going on. And in fact, I'd like us to look at Mark's account now for a second, Mark 6. And I want you just to see what they think is really happening. Mark 6 and verses 48, it says, And he saw them toiling in rowing, for the wind was contrary unto them. And about the fourth watch of the night, he cometh unto them, walking upon the sea, and would have passed by them. But when they saw him walking upon the sea, they supposed it had been a spirit and cried out. And so the idea is this. They thought they'd seen a ghost, right? They, th they thought it was a spirit they were witnessing walking on the sea. And it, it filled them with fear. Who is this, this supernatural creature that is walking on the waves coming towards them? And their hearts are gripped with fear. And notice they're supposing it was a spirit. You know, one of the things that can cripple us more than anything else is if we live our lives based on supposition. Supposing this is going to happen. Supposing that is going to happen. And, you know, the, the thing about it is that many of the things that we suppose are going to happen never actually happen. And so while we're living with this fear of the, the supposed thing that's going to happen, what it does is it paralyzes us. It, uh, it makes us very ineffective. I want to give you a couple of examples in Scripture where men of God made foolish decisions based on supposition. Let me ask you to go back to the book of Genesis in chapter 20. Genesis chapter 20. And verse 11. And Abraham said, because I thought, in other words, he's supposing 
surely the fear of God is not in this place and they will slay me for my wife's sake. Remember when Abraham, this man of faith, he lied about his wife. He said, she's my sister. Now, again, she was related to him. Uh, she was a stepsister, but, but nevertheless, uh, he, he wouldn't own her as his wife because he, he was certain because there was no fear of God in this place, they would kill him for Sarah's sake. Now, let's look, by the way, at how genetic uh, this lying because of fear based on supposition was. Look at Genesis 26 and verses 7 through 11. And the men of the place asked him of his wife, and he said, she is my sister, for he feared to say she is my wife. Lest, said he, the men of this place should kill me for Rebekah, because she was fair to look upon. And it came to pass when he had been there a long time that Abimelech, king of the Philistines, looked out a window and saw, and behold, Isaac was sporting with Rebekah, his wife. And Abimelech called Isaac and said, Behold, of a surety she is thy wife. And how saidst thou, she is my sister? And Isaac said unto him, Because I said, Lest I die for her so on and so forth. And so you get the picture that on two occasions, great men of God were gripped by fear based on supposition. They had no concrete evidence to suggest that this was going to happen, but based on fear, as a result of that, they actually uh, lied about their relationship. And so we've got to be careful that we do not be gripped with fear based on supposition. When they saw this figure coming towards them, they, they supposed it was a ghost. Uh, by the way, the disciples weren't cured of that either. In Luke 24, when the Lord appeared after his resurrection, they thought again that he was a ghost. Luke 24 and verse 37, it says, and as they spake, they thus spake, Jesus himself stood in the midst of them and saith unto them, Peace be unto you. But they were terrified and affrighted and supposed that they had seen a spirit. And so, again, fear based on supposition, very, very dangerous, dangerous thing. So notice in verse 20, it says, But he saith unto them, it is I, be not afraid. Now, again, I want to just say that if you were reading this in the Greek New Testament, it would say, he says to them, I am, be not afraid. That phrase, it is I, is, is the very phrase that's often translated I am, ego ami. He, he, he basically, Jesus is affirming that he is the I am, and because of who he is, don't you be afraid. As we go into this coming year, we don't know what's coming our way. And we, we could become gripped uh, by supposition, especially if we listen too much to the media. We could become petrified about what's going to happen in the year ahead. And the Lord would say to us today, I am. Don't be afraid. Don't be fearful because of who I am. If we could just get this, this is so critical to know that it is him that is caring for his people. Look at Isaiah chapter 43 just for a moment. I want you just to see a lovely verse, Isaiah 43, and a great promise. Isaiah 43, verses 2 and 3. Well, let me read from verse one. But now, now thus saith the Lord that created thee, O Jacob, and he that formed thee, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed thee. I have called thee by thy name. Thou art mine. When thou passest through the waters, I will be with thee. And through the rivers, they shall not overflow thee. When thou walkest through the fire, thou shalt not be burned. Neither shall the flame kindle upon thee. For I am the Lord thy God, the Holy One of Israel, thy Savior. And so again, I think it's important that we, we just affirm uh, 
that the Lord has redeemed us. We're his people. He loves us. And we do not have to fear because he is with us. Fear not. I am. Uh, what a wonderful assurance. And of course, the comfort of hearing his voice. It, it wasn't just the words he said, but it was the one who spoke the words. Fear not. Be not afraid, he says to them. I am. And so what comforting marvelous marvelous words now i want us to go back to matthew please in matthew 14 and i want to break in in verse 28 because there's something in matthew's account that john doesn't tell us notice it says in verse 28 peter answered him and said lord if it be thou bid me come unto thee on the water and he said come and when Peter was come down out of the ship, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. But when he saw the wind boisterous, he was afraid and beginning to sink. He cried, saying, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched forth his hand and caught him and said to him, O thou of little faith, wherefore didst thou doubt? And when they were come unto the ship, the wind ceased. I want us to just think about this portion just for a moment, because it's very fascinating as we consider Matthew's account of the story. And of course, Simon Peter, he said, if it's you, command me to come to you on the water. And of course, Peter gets out of the boat. And we like to kind of criticize Peter and all the rest of it. But I want to tell you, I'm impressed. He got out and he walked on the water, and the sea was stormy. And uh, it, it's an amazing thing. And, it, and of course, the Lord says, oh, thou of little faith, but I wonder how many of us would have got out of the boat. Uh, I suggest that he, he had tremendous faith initially. But what happened to Peter? Everything's going well until we read that word, but, in verse 30. That word, but, is a contrast word. Everything's going wonderful. He's walking on the water. He's going to Jesus. Uh, he's experiencing an amazing phenomena. But he took his eyes off the Lord Jesus, and he looked at the wind, boisterous, and he was afraid and beginning to sink. And I, I know we, we know this lesson, and we know it, but we need to be reminded of it because we forget it. If we look at circumstances, we're always going to sink, always. It was windy. It, it was <laughs> boisterous. Uh, the sea was rough. If we look at the circumstances, we'll surely sink. But if we look at the Savior, we'll surely walk. And, and this is really important. And I think it's important in our day because... I see so many Christians and their hearts are failing them for fear. And the reason is they're locked into the media and they're hearing all the doom and gloom on the media and they're panicking and they're not looking at the savior, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. This is what we must do as we enter into another stormy year. We have to keep our eyes firmly fixed on the Lord Jesus. And so, because his heart is filled no longer with confidence, but with fear. Fear enters the heart based on circumstances and faith departs, and you get that sinking feeling. Well, how we need to keep our eyes firmly fixed on the Lord Jesus as we enter this coming year. And notice as Peter is sinking, we have one of the, one of the shortest prayers in Scripture, and it's a delightful prayer that Peter prays, uh, and it, it's, it's very to the point. Uh, he just simply says, Lord, save me. How many people will be in heaven 
because of a short, simple prayer, Lord, save me. <laughs> you remember that great hymn? I was sinking deep in sin, sin sinking to rise no more, right? It, this is the way it is for many people, sinking deep in sin, but they look to the Savior as their only hope and cry out to him, Lord, save me. And the instant that somebody does that, he reaches out a hand. And he plucks them out of the sinking mire they're in, and he gloriously saves them by his grace. Notice, too, who was addressed in Peter's prayer. He's speaking to the Lord Jesus. Lord, save me. Some zealous brethren would tell us that the Lord Jesus should never be addressed in prayer. They say, you always pray to the Father in the name of the Son, in the power of the Holy Spirit. And they've got this formula, this package down pat. And that's the way it is. And woe betide you if you ever address the Lord Jesus. I'm not sure how they got saved, to be honest. But I want to suggest to you that not only does Peter address the Lord Jesus in prayer, but also Stephen, the first martyr, addressed the Lord Jesus in prayer. And I think it's perfectly legitimate to pray to the Lord Jesus, to address him in prayer, to, to not only uh, in our initial conversion, many of us cried out those simple words, Lord, save me. But in gratitude and thanksgiving, have we not addressed the Savior and thanked him for what he did for us on Calvary's cross? And so I think we've got to be careful that we don't uh, get kind of a pigeonhole idea. Now, I, I recognize the normal system is you pray to the Father, in the name of the Son, in the power of the Holy Spirit. But where Scripture shows others addressed in prayer, it legitimizes praying to the Lord Jesus as well. And so we want to recognize that. Notice the words of Peter, uh, the Lord to Peter, O thou of little faith, wherefore didst thou doubt? Little faith doubt. This is problems, the problem with Peter. And often it's our problem. Our problem is looking at circumstances, not looking at the Lord, looking at circumstances, not focusing on the promises of God. And as a result of that, we're caused to doubt and our faith is diminished. And so if there's a message for us from this, this section, <clears throat> it would be this, let us be those that whatever 21 holds out for us, we will be those whose eyes are firmly fixed on the Lord Jesus and not on circumstances. Remember when the spies went into the promised land? Remember there were 12 spies. Two of them saw the Lord. Ten of them saw the giants. The ones that saw the giants, they're crippled by fear and they cause great defeat for the people of God. Two of them, Joshua and Caleb, they're the ones we remember. You probably don't remember anybody else's names <laughs> out of the 12, but you'll remember till the day you go into glory, the names of Joshua and Caleb, because they saw the Lord. May God help us to see the Lord in 2021 and not see the giants not see the circumstances, but have faith in him and stand upon the promises of God. So notice verse 32, it says, when they were coming to the ship, the wind ceased. There's so many miracles actually going on in this. We're saying this, this is the fifth sign, uh, which it is, but actually uh, you've got uh, the calming of the storm, You've got Jesus walking on the water. You have Peter walking on the water. I mean, this is multiple miracles that are going on here all at the same time. And we've got one more to come. We're not even done yet. There's actually four amazing events in this one passage. But I want you just to think by way of contrast for a second. I find this very interesting that when Jesus got into the boat, it says the wind ceased. When they were come into the ship, the wind ceased. I want you to look back to the prophet Jonah. Because when Jesus got in the boat, the wind ceased. 
But in the case of Jonah, when he was thrown out of the boat, the wind ceased. Jonah 1 verse 15. It says, so they took up Jonah and cast him forth into the sea, and the sea ceased from her raging. So just kind of an interesting thing. Jesus in the boat, you have calm. When you have somebody like Jonah, who's a believer running away from God, you end up with all kinds of storms. And it's only when he's out of the picture does calm restored and so just a, an interesting contrast in those two events now look please at verse uh, 33 notice it says then they that were in the ship came and worshiped him saying of a truth thou art the son of god this is a very fascinating event they in the ship worship the lord jesus and they said without question of a truth <laughs> thou art the son of god now some things that we need to concentrate our minds on at the moment is this one thing for sure is this if jesus was anything but god his accepting worship was a blasphemous act because the Bible is clear that only God is to be worshipped. And sometimes when people try to worship Peter, he quickly said, worship God only. Uh, when they tried to worship uh, Paul uh, uh, in uh, his missionary journey, again, he tore his garments. No, worship God. And, and so for, for mere men to accept worship is, is absolute, utter blasphemy. And yet the very fact that they worshipped him and he did not chide them, but received their worship is evidence that he indeed is the eternal son of God, the word that was with God, the word that is God. And so now back to John's gospel. The one who is verily worthy of worship. And we notice in verse 21. It says, then they willingly received him into the ship, and immediately the ship was at the land whither they went. <clears throat> Remember we uh, mentioned that we wanted to revisit that picture of the unsaved people that were on the sea of time, as it were, in their little canoe, so to speak, and the storms are blowing. And... Notice it tells us here in our verse 21, then they willingly received him into the ship. And it's only when a lost soul willingly receives Jesus to come into their life will the calm re be restored to their lives and the trouble, the boisterousness will come to an end. And so we need to just recognize this, that that. He's not going to force himself on anybody, but a person must willingly receive him. And we already re read in John, didn't we? As many as received him, to them gave me the right, the power, the authority to become the children of God, uh, even those that believe on his name. But they have to willingly receive him. Oh, how the Lord loves them. He knows all about their circumstances. He, he wants to be with them and help them, but they must willingly receive him. He's not going to force himself on anyone. They have to accept him and receive him willingly into their lives. Once he was in, John tells us that immediately the ship was at the land whither they went. Now, I want to give you two possibilities here, and I, I think there's only one right answer. But I think maybe the other one is good by way of application. One is that it was the fourth miracle in this one sign. That the minute the Lord Jesus was in the ship, they were at the land. I mean, in other words, 
this only halfway across the lake, but the minute he gets in, they're at the lake, uh, at the at the shore. And of course, we believe that. We believe that that this is a supernatural event and a supernatural person. And I do believe that Im immediately he got in, even though they were rowing, they were only halfway across, the minute that he got in, they were taken to the shore. And so that's the, I think, the right interpretation. But I want to suggest to you by way of application that as they worshipped him, remember it, we saw in Matthew's account that when they worshipped him, Sometimes when we're worshiping the Lord, it seems like time has no meaning. Have you ever been at a remembrance meeting where it's just so evident that the presence of the Lord is there, there's just a delightful time, and then somebody gets up and gives thanks for the loaf, and you say, where did the time go? <laughs> what happened? It, it just seemed like it just went so quickly because it, we were so preoccupied with Christ and that hour just seemed like a few seconds, and it was over. And so I want to suggest to you, actually, it was a supernatural event. They, another miracle, fourth one in this series, they ended up on the shore. But on the other hand, what a wonderful thing it is to be preoccupied with Christ, so preoccupied with him that you lose all track of time. And that just seems like eternity has come down into time and we're just enjoying and basking in those things. So in conclusion, as we enter into this year, we have no idea, just as last year, if you'd have told me what this year would have been like in January of 2020, I, I couldn't have even imagined the things that have happened. And yet, one thing I can tell you is the Lord's faithfulness, that he has been there throughout the whole thing. And as we enter into 21, we have no idea what the year will bring. But please, dear saint, keep your eyes on Jesus. Get your eyes on him. Don't be looking at the circumstances because it will cripple you with fear and, and will be so damaging to you spiritually. Keep your eyes on him. And then let's be like the Lord Jesus, who got often times alone with his father. And oh, how we need to be those that spend time often alone with our God and father. And then do we get paralyzed by supposition? Living in this realm of supposing this and supposing that. And, and so often we can be intimidated by things we think are going to happen. They don't happen. And so let's be careful that we deal with reality, not with supposition. And then do we see our unsaved friends, not with any sense of envy, but with pity? They're on the sea. Of, they've been launched onto the sea of time, and they have no captain of their salvation, and they have no anchor for their souls. And when the storms begin to blow, they're all at sea in the dark alone. They desperately need a savior. And how we need to encourage them to willingly receive him in to their lives so that he might be their guide and bring them back across to shore heaven, just like he will with us. So the many, many lessons, practical lessons, I think, from this section, very appropriate as we begin this, this new year together. May the Lord encourage us as we contemplate these things. Amen.